you can go thank ahead manish yeah. thank, you. thank you so much i like to thank ai's office especially dr namrata madam and dr rajesh sinha sir and moderator dr chandima for this honor and opportunity to be part of this program am i audible yes clear thank you so much so my topic is glaucoma beyond intraocular pressure we'll start with a case report which is related to this topic this is a 38 year old gentleman who came for us for our opinion this patient was already on brimonidine the intraocular pressure was 12 mm mercury in both the eyes Uh, we went into the record the patient had a baseline pressure of 22 mm mercury recorded with a non contact tonometer angles were open on gonioscopy cct was high so with this cct you can see actually 22 was a normal intraocular pressure even as a baseline but the patient has very very advanced field loss both in the right eye and the left eye even the oct was showing changes in the rnfl thickness we see the disc the right eye disc is around 0.7 With some amount of pallor. If you see the left eye, it looks to be an advanced cupping, but definitely there is some pallor in the left eye also. But it's also important that is this glaucoma. A very important point in glaucoma is the disc and the field correlation. If you see the disc in this right eye compared to the field, when you see a normal tension glaucoma or even a primary opening glaucoma with the 0.7 or 0.8 cupping, you don't expect such an advanced field loss. So this is a there is a mismatch in the disc and the field finding. also what is important is the presence of pallor so when you have this mismatch when you have pallor you should think of other possible causes for example when we took a history in this patient patient had a history of consumption of country lucre and the patient was actually a case of a methyl alcohol poisoning so these patients with methyl alcohol poisoning after few years often present with secondary cupping and can mimic glaucoma the reason i shared this case because nowadays because of use of sanitizers and because of the corona pandemic lot of us are getting cases related to methanol toxicity so in over period of time we may get cases like these mimicking as glaucoma also very interesting thing was dr tuli sir was also highlighting that we cannot blindly rely on the investigation to see this oct oct is showing a thinning of the rnfl thinning of the rnfl can occur in traumatic optic neuropathy it can occur in aiun it can occur in even methyl alcohol poisoning just presence of rnfl thinning is not an indication of glaucoma a correlation of all the findings is extremely important for glaucoma point of view so whenever you see pallor more than cupping or early involvement of vision normal tension glaucoma in a young patient or field which are obeying the vertical meridian you should always think beyond glaucoma try to look for other possible causes now coming back to the glaucoma beyond intraocular pressure this is the patient who i have been following up for years this is a 72 year old one eyed gentleman a known hypertensive he lost his left eye due to crvo right eye had a 6 9 and 6 vision at the time of presentation the patient had advanced normal tension glaucoma you can see the disc finding extremely advanced cupping left eye was hazy because of old vitty the maximum pressure which was ever recorded for this patient was 12 to 16 mm mercury the cct was normal angles were open on gonioscopy but if you see the fields extremely advanced field loss which are also matching with the advanced cupping which we are having and the patient i have been following for almost 5 years you can see from 2014 till 2018 the patient is on prostaglandin analog this is a patient with normal tension glaucoma where the drug of choice is always the prostaglandin and this patient over last 5 years have maintained a very good intraocular pressure at times the pressure is in single digit pressure has never gone beyond 10 or 11 mm mercury we have even done a 24 hour diurnal and then also we couldn't find any iop spike but the disease continues to progress you can see the 10 days to also the patient is continuing progressing over last 5 years so whenever you have these patients where there is a progression even on well controlled iop you should think that maybe there are certain non iop factors which might be coming into action in these patients this type of patient there are few investigation which are required first we should take a proper history of steroid a lot of the time these patients are using oral steroid for certain systemic problems sometimes they are using even steroid ointment occupation is important maybe the patient is a trumpet player or he plays shank or does a certain exercise related to valsalva maneuver gonoscopy again is very important especially in fakic eyes you should recheck the gonoscopy whether you have missed any uh, subtle angle closure also if all these things are fine you should go for a detailed systemic evaluation because you know 
ischemic factor is an important factor in glaucoma so a carotid evaluation a cardiac evaluation a blood lipid profile blood sugar even if required you can do a neuroimaging to make sure you are not missing any other neurological problem which might be causing this progressive optic neuropathy 24 hour blood pressure measurement to look for any nocturnal dip of blood pressure is also important also look for sleep apnea you can take an opinion of a pulmonologist try to look for sleep apnea sleep apnea can lead to raised valve salva and can lead to progression of glaucoma so a detailed workup is extremely crucial for these patients because a lot of time we see over time these patients keep continuing to progress but what is the next option Sometimes, in spite of all the investigation, you may not be able to pinpoint any particular cause. Sometimes we believe maybe it's just the age-related change, but you need to treat these patients. So in these patients, in the patient is already on prostaglandin, and if you want to add a adjunct, the common options we have is either the beta blockers or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or the brimonidine. Trabeculectomy, I will not keep as an option in this case because the patient is already on one medication and the pressures are again well controlled with one medication and we have other options to be added. Beta blocker will not be a very good option because beta blocker, we all know, has an effect on the optic nerve perfusion. And since the pressure control is not important here, so beta blocker may not be very good adjunct for these cases. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitor for its supposed role in ocular blood flow and brimonidine for its hypothetical role in neuroprotection may be a better option in this case compared to a beta blocker. This brings us to the important topic of discussion today is that glaucoma management beyond IOP. We now all know that it takes 40 to 50% of the retinal ganglion cells to die before we can see any visible changes on the perimetry. And intraocular pressure is the most important or rather the only way to control progression in our glaucoma patient. But even the landmark tiles like the ocular hypertension treatment study, the EMGT and the CNGT, they have shown that in spite of reaching the target intraocular pressure, there is a group of patients which continues to progress. And all these things have been highlighted in this trial. So although the patient has reached the target which we have designed, but the progression has not stopped. So reaching target intraocular pressure will not completely stop progression. So there the concept comes that if we can have a control of intraocular pressure, plus in some way we can increase the retinal ganglion cell survival, maybe by enhancing or improving the retinal sensitivity through neuroprotection or by improving the retinal vascularity by affecting the blood flow, we may give a better treatment to our patient compared to just controlling the intraocular pressure. Now we'll just quickly touch the vascular factors in glaucoma. We all know about the perfusion pressure. Perfusion pressure or the ocular blood flow is dependent on the mean arterial blood pressure and the intraocular pressure by the vascular resistance. Now, vascular resistance is something which we cannot modify. It depends on the vascularity of the patient, depends on arterial sclerosis, diabetic status, hypertension. So this is more dependent on the systemic factors. But mean arterial blood pressure is diastolic plus one third systolic minus diastolic blood pressure. So let us see how ocular perfusion is affected. So suppose your blood pressure is higher, sorry, the blood pressure is lower and the IOP is higher, your ocular blood flow will actually go down. So what happens at night? And again, this what happens, you know, we all know that at night, IOP tends to be higher because the patient is supine and there is raised episcular venous pressure. So IOP tends to be higher. A lot of our patients do have a nocturnal dip of blood pressure. So at night, the BP tends to go down. So if you go by this equation, your perfusion pressure actually goes down at night. So we can say that although the patient is sleeping at night, the doctor is sleeping at night, the disease is not sleeping. So glaucoma progression probably occurs more at night than what it occurs during daytime. And this is the reason why we always highlight that we should be using anti-glaucoma medication, which give you a 24 hour IP control and not only a daytime IP control. So drugs like prostaglandin, even carbonic energy inhibitor, which give you a 24 hour IP control are a better options in patients with normal tension glaucoma. Coming to ocular blood flow, just for summary, the one of the problem with ocular blood flow is that till now we don't have a proper tool to measure ocular blood flow and we don't know what is the ideal way and ideal thing to be measured. Whether we should be checking the central artery flow, whether we should be checking the posterior ciliary arteries or the ophthalmic artery and none of the tools which have, have a good predictability. So there is a high inter and inter-observable variability. 
plus even when we measure the ocular blood flow how much impact it will create on our clinical decision is again difficult to quantify but personally i have seen in case patients with normal tension glaucoma where you are seeing disc changes like there are disc hemorrhages these patients you can assume that there is a ischemic factor playing and these cases using a carbonic and adhesive inhibitor as the adjunct to prostaglandin can be a better option coming to neuroprotection again not totally established in human is also a hypothesis but coming to neuroprotection you know if you see the what happens in retinal ganglion cell injury there are multiple factors which lead to retinal ganglion cell death for example the intraocular pressure the ischemia genetic factors trophic support failure but when we are treating we are treating only the iip because rest of the factors is not totally our under our control so in some way if we can achieve target iip plus protect the target cell the point which i was highlighting by enhancing the sensitivity of retinal ganglion cell less we can probably give a better treatment to our patient there are many studies on animals but this is probably the best study on neuroprotection what we have in humans and this is also an indirect evidence the loger trial that is the low pressure glaucoma treatment study and this what they have done they have class, uh, divided the low pressure glaucoma patient or normal tension patient into two groups one group which received brimonidine 0.2% and other group received timolol and they followed up this patient for four years and what they found that over four year period the intraocular pressure was same in both the groups as expected because both brimonidine and timolol will give you around 20 to 25% of iip reduction so the iip reduction was similar in both the groups but the progression was more in the timolol group compared to brimonidine group they thought that hypothesize that maybe because of the neuroprotective effect of brimonidine the progression was less in the brimonidine group compared to timolol group or maybe because of the detrimental effect of timolol on the optic nerve perfusion the progression was more in timolol compared to brimonidine group so indirectly they concluded that if you have a patient with low pressure glaucoma a brimonidine or alpha agonist provided the door patient develop allergy will cause less visual field progression than a patient who is on timolol again it's indirect evidence and there were some dropouts in the brimonidine group because of the allergy to conclude cochrane library has done a analysis on neuroprotection in patients with glaucoma in adults and they found that there are studies for example the logis trial but till now the data is inconclusive the whether we can use brimonidine purely for its neuroprotective action we still use mainly for its eye protection so neuroprotectin brimonidine is sort of like hydroxychloroquine in corona a lot of us are using but probably we don't have enough evidence to support it and another important factor i'll highlight before i share in my presentation related to intraocular pressure you know we always think about controlling iop but we have to understand that non compliance is a very important factor in our population so that factor also has to be looked into whenever we are treating your patient because drugs won't work in patient who don't take them so always try to give a simple regime for the patients to follow always try to educate your patient every time the patient is coming also try to involve the family members in the treatment process i just give you one example if you have a patient who is on a beta blocker with alpha agonist and a prostaglandin and you switch to a combination with a prostaglandin instead of using six drops you can make it three drops and instead of using three bottles you can make it two bottles so definitely you will make life more easy for your patients patient will use the medicine more frequently the cost will go down the preservative will go down and these factors are equally important than just prescribing medicine and controlling intraocular pressure so i just like to conclude saying that iip reduction is the mainstay in glaucoma treatment but if you have a patient who is progressing in spite of well controlled pressure try to look into other factors the systemic factors try to look into the compliance and when using as adjunct to prostaglandin in a normal tension glaucoma or a low tension glaucoma a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor or alpha agonist might be a better option than a beta blocker thank you so much thank you very much 